the jobs of the big of the richer countries is to put a lot of money into uh, energy storage and that would make a huge difference to the load factors effective load factors of re renewables and could make them uh, as it were the big thing and the big low cost thing in all this um, but we have to see and uh, nuclear energy provides different kinds of things uh, we could all be charging up our electric cars overnight on uh, base load nuclear power in in one model. So my feeling is to encourage uh, the learning around nuclear in, in the context of appropriate uh, safety and so on. And you know, I, I wouldn't equate, as it were, progress in uh, electric uh, electricity production using nuclear with the making of bombs. I mean, I think they're different. I think they're different things. And um, uh, I would not worry too much about that link. I would try to encourage uh, responsible, safe uh, expansion of nuclear in a way that allows us all to learn and allows that sharing of the learning. Do you have a question? We'll take one last question. Is gentleman here? I'm G.L. Pandit from Delhi University. I congratulate you for your excellent lecture and the options that you have outlined to address the issues of climate change responsibilities. I was wondering and wanting to ask you whether in your opinion degrowth would be an option to address the issues of climate change responsibilities. Thank you. Uh, short answer is no. Um, Suppose we um, suppose we stopped growing right now, everywhere around the world, and didn't change the way we did things. We'd be emitting 50 billion tons CO2 equivalent a year, yeah, and that's uh, unsustainable. That would be leading us in eventually into deep uh, trouble from the point of view of the climate, and what that says, I think, is the rather obvious and basic question, indeed motivation around this whole thing. It's all around breaking the link between consumption and production on the one hand and uh, climate responsibility emissions on the other. And unless we break that link, as that simple example at the beginning of what I just said, unless we break that link, we're not going to get there. So we have to break that link, and that's where we should begin. So. It wouldn't do it, just stopping growth, and it would be a political non-starter. Now you say, well, I've looked at this very hard, and I've decided that we're all going to be uh, less well off than we were before. Actually, we're going to be half as well off because we want to cut emissions by half. <laughs> would anybody listen to you? And you wouldn't be, you wouldn't deserve to be listened to in a world where there's so much poverty. Thank you. Uh, Nick, uh, I think we have to stop here because we're eating into our tea break and then the next session is scheduled to start at 11.30. But let me just, you know, very quickly thank Nick for brilliantly bringing this uh, conference to a start. It was absolutely brilliant framing of the narrative both globally and from India's point of view. And I think we'll be well advised as we go into the technical sessions to keep those three or four touch points that Nick mentioned, which is what does this mean for impacts, what does it mean for adaptation, what does the policy mean for mitigation, and what does it mean for sustainability. I think we'll keep those touch points in mind as we go into the uh, technical sessions. And many of those, as you will see, those of you stay back for the technical sessions, much of the synthesis work has been framed around these touch points, as you will see in, in a few, uh, I guess, minutes from now. So thank you very much, Nick, for the brilliant kickoff to this conference, and I thank all of you for being here. And once again, uh, uh, ICREA welcomes this opportunity in working with the Global Commission on this very exciting project on the new climate economy. Thank you all very much. <laughs>